We have been in the book of Acts. Uh, I don't know how long we'll be in the book of Acts, but uh, this is where the Lord led me, and we wanted to talk about the, the actions of the apostles. That's what it's about. And I said, well, we'll talk about the actions of New Holland. And are the actions of New Holland like the actions of the first century church? I would say that one thing that would be very important is the very first verse that we'll look at um, in chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 32 says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of, say it with me, one heart and one soul. We've heard that phrase over and over and over again. One accord, really what we're talking about. Not two. How many opinions does God have? Not you. Right? The old saying about us is where two or three are gathered together, we'll have 12 or 14 opinions. But, but how many opinions does God have? One, because it's the right opinion. It's true. And it's best. And it's nice to know that he doesn't waffle on things, right? So when we get connected with him, we don't come up with our opinions. <clears throat> I, I'm going to say this as boldly as I know how. God doesn't care what my opinion is, right? He cares what his opinion is. And what God cares about is, is, my, is my heart, is my life open to his will. Now, if we can agree on that, if we can agree that we need to change our life to the place of anything that's not according to His will, for His glory, right, in His way, with His love, but with that also comes His peace and His joy, right? Anything other than that is not good. It may be good, but it's not great. And sometimes we need to choose between our good and His best, and when we do that, something amazing can happen. And in this particular passage, we find that there is a group of people that are coming together. It says they're one heart, one soul, and it's amazing the joy and the possibility when God's people come together in his mission. We get the wonderful example here of how these Christians can come together and, and could walk with him. Now, there's a disclaimer I need to bring at the beginning of this, this sermon. Be very, 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 very careful about coming to the book of Acts to get doctrine. It's just how they lived it out. When Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, in there was quotes from Jesus. Though Luke didn't get saved until after Jesus was dead and ascended, right? But it, there were the quotes from all the people that were there and, and the in the Gospels, you'll find great doctrine. The epistles were written by men inspired by God to bring the holy word of God for us to the church, to the new believers. And there is wonderful and amazing doctrine there. But be careful about getting doctrine from the book of Acts. Pastor, why? Why? Because in there, you're seeing them live out their faith. It's, it's kind of like a, a walking testimony of how things happened. And you'll find some things in there that, that could beautifully fit together, but you'll also find some things there where they messed up. Anybody in here excited about when other people mess up? Right? How many of us do that? And, and, and it's okay as long as, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, as long as God gets glory from a person that's a sinful person, though we have the imputed righteousness of God, when God looks at us, He looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ, He sees us as perfect in Him. How many of y'all like being perfect in Him? But yet we know that we sin every day. Any perfect people in here? I thought we kicked them all out last week, right? <clears throat> we're just grateful that we're saved. Amen? And that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and nobody can get to us unless they first defeat Jesus, and that's not going to happen. So we're held in His powerful, loving hands for now and through eternity. And now we're being moved from grace to grace. 
Now we're being moved from, from not quite there yet to by the leadership of the, of the truth of God to be made more into the image of Christ. So here we're going to look at this passage and we're going to see some new believers in Jesus volunteering out of their love for God. And we also are going to see a, a correction that God needs to reveal. So if you have your Bible, would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? The words will be up on the screen. We're going to begin in chapter 4, verse 32. You there? Say amen. amen. If you can see the screen, say amen. amen. If you can see me, I'm sorry. <laughs> verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. Notice the word, neither did anyone. They're even united in that. They knew that Jesus was Lord of Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. This is one of the things that you need to be careful about in doctrine. All right? We'll talk more about that in just a second. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone, or excuse me, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. Now, I don't know how this got started, neither do you. Somebody thought it would be a good idea out of the love from their heart, and they saw the need. This is, there is great persecution that's happening, and there is great need among the people. And someone said, this is a great thing. Verse 35, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. This may have been the person who started it. His name actually means son of encouragement. But in verse 36, as it says, and Joseph, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of coming together with fellow believers and possibly some people who have not become a believer quite yet. And Lord, we come united to give you praise and glory and honor. We acknowledge you as God, the sovereign of the universe, the one and the only one that should be worshiped and praised. You have all power. There is nothing that you cannot do. You give us our next breath and the next beat of our heart. You watch over us. You know us completely. And you have brought us today the complete word of God. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will feed us from your word. I also pray, O oh Lord, that nothing I say, though I preach from the infallible Word of God, I pray that nothing I say will venture from that, will be my words or my speculations or my, even my thoughts. I pray that the beat of my heart, the words of my mouth, the thoughts in my mind will be wholly conformed to you. Lord, for all is vain if we're not hearing the truth from you. And Lord, if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God does not come to be our teacher, our advocate, and the one to bless us today. So speak, Lord, as you can. We need to hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. We find ourselves in a situation that's highlighted by this thing about Money. Money. Y'all like talking about money? 
That's what I think, Randy. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it's probably one of my least favorite subjects to talk about. But Jesus talked about money. It's in the New Testament. Matter of fact, Paul spoke about money in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 10, and said the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. Not money. Money's just a tool. It's something that God gives us that we can, we can share and it, we can pay our bills with. Y'all good with that? It, it, it's just a tool. But the love of money can creep into our hearts. And it can control our thoughts. It can control our behavior. It, we can be just absolutely saturated with wanting it. And it, that is the one that can bring in all types and kinds of evil. Hebrews chapter number 13 verse 5 says this. Keep your life free from the love of money. I'm going to say that again. We know that the love of money can take you in, in, in definitely wrong places. So he says, here's the admonition. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, not worrying about what you don't have. That second part was Brian. But the scripture says, be satisfied with what you have, for God himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. So be satisfied with what you have. Don't worry, my admonition, with what you don't have. God said he'd give you what you need, not all that you want. Matter of fact, how many of y'all, no, raise your hand, have played the lottery? I've never played the lottery. I've been to Vegas twice. I haven't put a nickel in the slot machine yet. I haven't won the lottery. I haven't played the lottery because... I think I'm, I'm probably one of those that if I had won the lottery and they gave me a billion dollars, I'd mess up. I'd probably start thinking about all the things and all the trucks I could have. Hey Amen. I might buy all of y'all a truck. No coconut cake, though, Deborah. You see, I can get confused because I can get my eye off of the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. So I'm not worried about those things because if God can take care of my heaven, I think he can take care of my time here on earth. And I am blessed. I have so very much. Matter of fact, I know of no one in all the earth that is as blessed as I am. This was an amazing thing that happened. People, they saw needs. They didn't care about what they were having to go through. So you know what they did? They just said, I've got some land. Let me sell it. I'll just take the proceeds and you just distribute it to each one as you see fit. Now, in the church, we do tithe. That is the first tenth. That means the first fruits of what you have. And, and that belongs to God. And you should bring it in honor of glory of Him for the work of Christ in the world. It, and, and I'll be very honest with you. If you can't trust God with your tithe, how can He trust you with the blessings that He wants to put in your life? If you can't be faithful with the small things, how can you be Lord over the things that God wants you to be in charge of? It's really just a thermometer that tells where your spiritual spirit is, your, 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 your feelings there with God. Can he trust you? I've heard people tell me that they can't afford to tithe. You know my saying, you can't afford not to, right? It's just a matter of how much do you love and trust God the providential sovereign God that we have. Amen? But that's not what this is. This is not doctrine. Jesus never taught you that you had to sell everything and give it away. Now, I was in my small group Monday, and we actually talked about this scripture in my small group. And uh, I, I made the statement that I just made, that, that, that it's not doctrine that you just take everything that you have and sell it, and, and bring it to the church. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. And My son, Jared, is in my small group. That's not me. And he said, what about the rich young ruler? Jesus told him, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and, and come and follow me. And I said, well, that's good. 
but that was because it was an impediment in that person's life. That man was controlled by the money. And when he had the opportunity to get rid of it, that impediment, and come and give it, repent, come and give his life to God and become a follower of Christ, he wouldn't do it. But nowhere is it seen as a doctrine that all of us must do. Y'all believe that? Say amen. If you have, if you, if you want to argue with me about that, you, you come and, and I'll show you that you're wrong and we can all agree together. But generosity comes from a grateful heart. And there's nothing bad about generosity. As a matter of fact, I believe generosity is one of the greatest forms of love that you can have. And generosity is also contagious. And when one was given, the other one said, wow, that's, amen. Why, we all look at it stuff that, that, that we've got everything in common. Why am I holding back too? And they went and they started selling stuff and, and, and giving it to their, look, if you win the lottery and you want to come tithe in the church, I'll take your money. Right? When I was in seminary, we had this discussion in one of our classes and there were the holy ones in the class. They were going to tell us about all, the, 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 actually in our class, it wasn't the lottery we talked about. It was if, if someone was uh, selling booze, moonshine. I said, well, the deacons would be in charge of that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. They all know where the booze is at anyway. But uh, if, if they were selling their, their moonshine and they were bringing it, would you accept it if it came from the wrong place? And I said, sure. Although everybody thought I was crazy. And I said, well, it all belongs to the Lord anyway. If he wants to bring some our way, it's just a tool. We'll sanctify that stuff, right? But, I mean, if you want to leave us in your will, bless you. I'm not asking you to, though. If you want to be generous to somebody you see on the street, Amen. I'm not going to tell you not to. You follow the whisper of God and we'll be good. But there's a but in this. Turn the page and look in chapter 5, verse 1. But. Now, if you have the idea that every chapter is a break, that's not the way it works. The, the chapters and verses were added later to the Word of God. So chapter 5, as it begins, is, is a continuation of what we just talked about in chapter 4. So when we get to chapter 5, it says, A certain man named Ananias, which means, the, the term Ananias means God is gracious. I thought that was unique. And Sapphira, his wife, her name means beautiful. They sold a possession. They got into what was happening in chapter 4. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, there's a phrase that we've seen before in the first four chapters when it talks about the Christians obeying God and being a part of it, it's called they were filled with the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down and just absolutely changed everything, it's because they were in need and the thing that they needed was God, God's love, God's blessing, God's control, God's leadership, the lordship of God in their life. And the Holy Spirit came and filled their life. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Ananias and Sapphira, as far as we know, were believers. They're not lost people. They were there. They were watching all this. They got caught up in it. And I'm not sure all the reasons why, neither are you, but it was probably envy, pride, maybe even coveting the praise that some of the other people like Barnabas were getting. So they, they probably had a conversation among themselves and said, you know, We've got some land. Why don't we do this too? Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's an awful lot of money. I mean, we worked hard for that. Or our 
forefathers worked hard for that. I don't know if I want to give that away. I don't know. Somebody said, well, maybe let's not give it all. Maybe we'll keep part of it for themselves. Listen in verse 3. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Verse 4 is very important. While it remained, was it not your own? When you owned the land, did it not belong to you? Well, yeah. After it was sold, was it not in your own control? You, it was your choice to sell it. And, and the money came to you, and all the land belonged to you, all the money belonged to you. Well, yeah. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Why did you bring part of it, but said that you brought all of it? You've not lied to men. You've lied to God. Now, I don't know all the reasons why Peter knew that they didn't give it all. Maybe he knew the land and he looked at the money and like, you got more than that out of it. I don't know. I have a, my, my opinion is, is it was probably the Holy Spirit telling him this. Because God was involved in this. And all Peter did was just said, why did you do this? You could have given 10% of it. You didn't have to give 10%. You could have done anything that you wanted to. But, but why did you say that you did one thing when you didn't? Don't you know God is watching? Listen, church, there are sins in our life, the sins that we are not okay with in our life that grieve us when we do it, and there are also the sins that we have in our life that we're kind of okay with. But let me ask you, which sins is God against and which sins is God for? The holy God. Are all sins wrong in God's eyes? Are all sins wrong in your eyes? Well, yeah, preacher, but... See, that's why chapter 5 began with a but. There's, this is where we drift in. If, if every one of us looked at gossip the way God looks at gossip, our vocabulary would absolutely change. If the God who gave up everything to come to earth and die on the cross so that we can be forgiven of our sins, if we looked at others and what they had done to, uh, done to us and we forgave them the way God forgave them, there'd be a whole lot of grace in this building, wouldn't there? He changed our language. He changed our attitude. He changed the motive of our heart. Hold on. Isn't that what he already has done? Didn't he come and call me to forgive me and love me? And my, my goal in life is to be Filled with the Holy Spirit. We call him Christ, Messiah, King. We call him Lord and we say that he is Lord over all. Yet, there's a but in there. Well, let me get to and show you what happens. Verse 5, then Ananias hearing these words fell down and breathed his last. The God who gives us every breath didn't give him another one. The God who gives him the beat of every heart said, you're done. Peter didn't kill him. Peter didn't pray for him to be killed. I dare say Peter did not want him to be killed. He was a fellow believer. But God said, enough. So great fear came upon them all, all those who heard these things. And the young men arose, wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. I'm glad I wasn't part of that committee. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, Tell 
tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together, here's a term, to test the spirit of the Lord, to see what you could get by with? Why have you chosen that your truth is better than God's truth? Your way is better than God's way. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Not because he's prophesying. He saw that God did it once. He was expecting God to do the same thing. Verse 10, they, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out and buried her by her husband. It's going to say it again. So great fear came upon all the church and all upon all who heard these things. Here's the question. Now we know Satan was behind this. He knows that he can't defeat Jesus. He knows that he can't defeat all the things that Jesus is doing in our lives. He can't stop him. The only thing that he can do is slow the work of Christ down by getting in us. He wants to come and divide and conquer. He wants to divide us from each other, but he wants to divide us from God because he knows God is holy. God is pure. And I'm going to make a statement here. And I pray that you hear it. God will not bless sin. God cannot bless sin. Now, he can forgive us of sin. But God's not the kind of God that's going to do the wink, wink, nod. It's all right. I'll let you pass through. He'll take us to heaven because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered all our sins. And none of us would make it otherwise. Other denominations teach that you can have your salvation and you can lose it. I want to get saved and somebody shoot me in the head. Because if I got saved and I got right with God and I went out there and somebody cut in front of me in the road, I'd just lose my salvation that quick. But I'm grateful that when God saves us, He saves us to the uttermost. And He keeps us. But God wants us to be filled. Satan wants lukewarm. Matter of fact, Satan really doesn't want you cold. He wants you lukewarm. You get cold, God's not going to, God, God's going to deal with it. And however he does it, whatever way, he's sovereign. I don't give him ideas. All I know is he's never made a mistake. Light makes darkness go away. But if we block the light, there is a shade of darkness. If we stayed in this room, if I preached as long as I want to, it'd be dark in here before we left. The lights were off because I'd be the only one left in here. Everybody else would have left. But when the light begins to go down, there's a shift as light goes away and darkness begins to creep in and there's a shade of darkness. And if we're not careful, we get, a, we get very comfortable with not being all light. God's not going to let us get all dark. But we're comfortable with the amount of light that we want. And it's almost like we've got the control of the blinds. And the light of God shines in, and we want to cut back on that a little bit and, and, and only allow a little bit in to our own detriment. Let me just say it this way. When we get into heaven, it's not going to be that way. Oh, when we look into the glory of His face, there will not be a sun in the sky. There will not be a moon. Jesus, His glory will be the only light there and it will shine bright forevermore. Can I get a good, great amen? amen? But on earth, there's not one thing Satan can do to make that stop except change our way of viewing it. 
Now, we looked in chapter 4. They were together, one heart, one soul. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. But now, Ananias and Sapphira have, have, have taken Satan's bait. And they kept back part and they lied. For whatever reason, they did. And now, they're having to live with the consequences. So let me get to it very plainly, very quickly. Let me tell you how God judges. Are you ready? By the motive of your heart. Preacher, what does that mean? When you sin and the Holy Spirit reveals that sin to you, what do you do with it? What is your desire? What is the desire of your heart? Is it to serve you? Is to protect what you think is yours? That you're going to do what you agree with, that, you, that God's calling you to do, you're going to ignore the rest? What is the motive of your heart? We're supposed to come to God. What was the great Shema? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's hard. And as y'all know, I'm not there. And there are days that I don't want to be there to my own detriment. And I've made this statement many times. I'm as close to God as I want to be. And so are you. And when I reveal to myself, when I understand God is looking for a broken and contrite heart. Now, if he finds somebody, not perfect, we're none of us are perfect, but if he finds somebody with a broken and contrite heart, man, he will be there. He will be loving. He will be pouring out the mercy, just pouring out the mercy. He'll be, will be wanting to restore joy and peace and love. It's like the father will come and wrap his arms around him and say, it's okay, I got you, I got you, I got you. But if we come and God wants to put his arms of love around us and we, we want to keep him at arm's length, that's not his fault. Now, every one of us, God's going to say, your time on earth is done. Every one of us, he's going to say, come home. And when God says it, it don't matter what the emergency room doctor says. They can thump me and thump me and thump me and beat on me and beat on me and breathe in me. By the way, don't do that to me. You can pray over me all you want to, but look, if, if, if they can keep me alive just that I can get back up and preach some more. All right. If there's something that they need to cut out, cut it out. I don't care. Whatever. But when God says, come home, nothing's going to change that. I've lived 60 years. I didn't think I was going to live this long. I started counting how many times I could have died before I was 21 years old. Scared me to death. Evidently, God wasn't through with me yet. But it doesn't matter if I live to 61 or 101. I want my life to bring glory and honor and praise to Him. And I might not be everything that I need to be. But I am so grateful that God has done a work of grace in my life and I'm not the person I used to be. Aren't you grateful that the things that we do are not date stamped forever? Some of the things I look back on, and I'm like, oh, you didn't. You didn't. You idiot. Why in the world? See, I can call myself an idiot. Y'all can do that when I'm not around. <laughs> but I'm grateful that you don't see me today date stamped to what I was. What you see is a trophy of his grace. He knows my heart, Craig. He knows what he wants to do in my life. He knows what he wants to do in your life. So let me share something real quick. 
Guard your motives. If God judges by the motive of your hearts, guard your motives. Listen to the Word of God and respect it and honor it. Keep it in awe and fear like they said. Fear came upon all of them. All reverence, respect. Keep a great desire and an obedience to the Word of God more than what you think or what others think. Be very careful about the small steps in the wrong direction because what you don't realize is you're trying to create more darkness in your life. And the only one that's satisfied with shades of darkness is Satan. The last church that Jesus spoke to John about in the book of Revelation was called the Church of Laodicea. If you ask them their thoughts about themselves, whether it's that they were rich, increased with goods, and had need of nothing. But the truth of the matter was, when Jesus looked at them, he called them wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then there's this amazing statement. I would rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Literally, a lukewarm Christian makes him sick at his stomach. I want to I want to define lukewarm as some light and some darkness at the same time. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold because nobody, cold is deceptive. But lukewarm is very deceptive. Somebody will look and they'll say, that's what a normal Christian is supposed to be. Is this what, if that's what a normal Christian is supposed to be, I don't want any part of it. And God thought it was so important that he took Ananias and Sapphira's life. It was deceptive. <clears throat> um, we just need to watch our motives and understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just because He gives us mercy doesn't mean we're getting by with it. Our goal needs to be filled with the Spirit.